so I think we're going to get started. So we, unbeknownst to you, or you may not be able to tell it, but we have a very special evening planned. And anybody who's not here will not know what they're missing as well. But uh, I'm Dave Hatem, um, and I'm part of the Humanities Lab here at UMass, and also run a creative writing elective. Um, and I'm here to introduce the um, 20th Annual Berlin Creative Writing Award. My introduction and my comments really are one of thanks um, and to thank really the library who has run this. Uh, and so Regina Raboy uh, also wanted to um, recognize Christine Shostead and Morgan Kalinsky, um, who really are running the contest and doing so much for you that you don't even realize behind the scenes. The other thing that I want to say is just that if we think about what's written and we think about pictures, somebody was, to, I saw a headline today about what happened in Baltimore and then somebody showed me a video and I thought just seeing the picture of it made such a different impact than reading a headline. Well, we really had the privilege this year of seeing some incredible writing and having some very difficult decisions. Um, and yet I think one of the features of the writing that we saw was how clear the pictures were that people were painting. You could really see the story. And the other thing that's really nice, especially for us, is we get to do this in person. There's a Zoom audience. Um, they, for the 20th, there's actually three former winners who were I'm going to come back, although illness has gotten one of them, apparently. So um, they won't all be here, but they will both do some reading and talk a little bit, I think, or Richard may talk about what they've told them that the award and what writing, how that fits into things. So my goal here now is really to turn it over to Richard um, and really begin to hear what you've written because that's the feature of tonight. So thanks for coming. Um, Thanks for those who are on Zoom and really look forward to hearing um, all the readings. Thanks so much, Dave, for all you do. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this year's very special 20th anniversary uh, award ceremony. Uh, we've been working for many, many, many months collaboratively as a, as a group uh, to make this a, a great evening, and I, I hope it pans out well. Uh, as Dave said, there are so many people who uh, I need to thank for their involvement in uh, creating the event. Regina, at the center of all the activities, um, everything from coordinating the submissions to video recordings with authors who can't be here this evening, uh, and so much more. Always so thoughtful, a smile, a laugh, and your calm, steady hand. And many, many, many thanks to the, uh, Regina's team members, Christine Shostead and Morgan Kalinsky, who do uh, all the hard work behind the scenes. So thank you so much. And thank you, my fellow judges, uh, Dave Hatem and Susan Tarrant. We've been a, a trio for many years. And this year we had a, a new judge, Sunita Puri, uh, who joined us and it was a it was a great year to have more hands on deck because we got a record number of 53 submissions this year which is about double uh the usual number uh, i also want to just give an extra special uh layer of thanks for dave hatem dave for your friendship your long-standing commitment to the medical humanities and creative writing and also a, a big nod of approval for your own creative writing. Uh, I know from my daughter's UMass Medical School experience, just how central you are to the lives and personal development and emotional well-being of our medical students. So thank you. And for people who uh, submitted a piece of writing for the contest this year and did not make it into the winner's circle, as I said, it was an amazingly competitive year with 53 submissions. And I hope above all things that the award uh, 
stimulated you to write, to reflect on your experiences. And I hope that uh, you continue to hone your craft and submit, submit your work to us next year. Uh, one other person, my brother, Daniel Berlin, I see you're on Zoom. Uh, no one would be more connected to our father than uh, my brother. Uh, and he's watching from his home in Amherst, uh, about a mile up the road from, or down the hill from Emily Dickinson. Okay. So a very brief history of uh, how the award got started 20 years ago. Uh, named after my father, and it, it turns on my father's illness, uh, Gerald Berlin, 37 years old, diagnosed with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And a few years later, uh, he developed what, what was diagnosed at that time as uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And he died uh, when he was 56 uh, from uh, cancer of the bowel. My father had the best doctors in the world. Um, and as connected as he was with them, he often said, my doctors know my numbers, but they don't know me. And when he began to complain of symptoms that suggested colon cancer, his doctors just somehow couldn't hear him. And I know they did their best. I believe that if they, but I believe that if they had been able to listen to him a little bit uh, more closely, if they had been able to connect with his suffering in a different way, maybe he would have been properly diagnosed and treated a bit sooner. And that might have that maybe he would have lived a few years longer and had a better quality of life. So flash forward 13 years after my father's death, I was in my early 40s. And for reasons I can't quite explain, uh, my midlife change wasn't a red sports car. It was learning how to play the electric guitar and writing poetry. Uh, I had wished that I had started both of those at a much earlier age. And that's part of the stimulus uh, to me to sponsor this award, to uh, encourage people to write a, a little younger than when I started out. So I wrote for a few years and after a while I had a pile of poems that I arranged into my first book. It went out for submissions with the title For a Stronger Magic, which was a line from one of the poems. And I don't know if you, if you know about how uh, poetry books tend to get published, but it's through university contests to get literally hundreds of submissions, pick one. So the odds are probably uh, tougher than getting into medical school. Uh, but I was persistent. Uh, I got up to um, submission number 180 without any luck. And I decided I was gonna revise my manuscript, but I went through it and I couldn't really find anything I wanted to change in the text. So I changed the title. And I changed the title to How JFK Killed My Father. And that one change uh, got finalist award, finalist award, still not published, finalist award. And finally, at number 215, I got a call from the editor of uh, the Pearl and director of the Pearl Poetry Prize in California uh, and to tell me that, ask me if my book was still available because they would like to publish it as the winner of their award context. So the award was uh, a big pile of books and $1,000. And I thought about what to do with that $1,000 um, that might make um, a difference and came up with the idea of establishing a creative writing award in honor of my father, just hoping uh, that it would stimulate uh, medical students and other people in medical training uh, to get to start writing a little bit sooner than I did, and hopefully to bring the caregivers closer to their patients. So a few Berlin Award statistics over uh, the 20 years. Uh, the uh, prose writers dominated 15 years uh, prose winners, five years uh, poetry winners, uh, and Two of the writers, uh, Noah Rosenberg and uh, Laurel O'Connor, both won the record tied for th uh, three-time prize winners. Uh, and Noah's here to tell us more. Um, the, the winner of the uh, 
uh, first year contest, Sush uh, Jangi uh, is ill and couldn't make it to uh, tonight. He was going to uh, be our first speaker, um, but he uh, sent me a paragraph to just describe what he's been up to since graduation. It's really pretty impressive. Uh, after graduation in 2009, he completed his internal medicine residency at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and a fellowship in uh, GI at Brigham and Women's. And then he completed training in inflammatory bowel disease from UC San Diego. He currently works uh, as an IBD doctor at Tufts, where he does 50% research, 50% clinical practice. And since residency, he's been writing extensively about public health for the Boston Globe, for NPR, the New Republic, the New England Journal of Medicine, and the San Diego Tribune. He's also been writing long-term, long-form fiction, which he describes as a challenging, consuming, and rewarding process. And as a researcher, uh, he finds that his writing has been essential to his developing grant proposals and capturing the interest and attention of funders. He says, quote, writing has continued to be an important part of my life. For me, it's a way of serving the public and, it, and to also pursue my own hobby and creative development. So Shush, get well soon. Now on to uh, some of this year's award winners. Uh, our first is an honorable mention winner, Melanie Fu, who's a MS1, who says she's always trying to write more. Born in, uh, in Ohio and raised in California, she's currently on her eighth year in Massachusetts. And in her free time, she likes seeing live music, being creative, and video calling her family dog named Cabernet. Uh, Melanie's going to read her piece, His Name is Phil. Hello, is it working? Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, hope you're having a good evening. His name is Phil, and he's a retired racing greyhound, formerly known as Road Gator, beginning to get that face frostiness of canine old age. Every time I pick him up for a walk, he greets me with a big stretch and then pads over to greet me. He's timid. When I walk him on weekdays, people gasp on the street, so big, like a horse. When I walk him on Sundays, we go to the nursing home. In the lobby, Phil towers silently over the other dogs all little terriers and mini doodle mixes before we split up to go to the floors. Hello? I poke my head into room after room. The air always smells like nursing home, still sterilized, faintly of urine. No, no, some residents say, too big. Others are asleep, their TVs droning low. But some people like him because he is calm and tall enough that they can pat him from their beds. He is always willing. Phil is not really like a dog sometimes. Rather, he has the demeanor of a somber Victorian child. In elevators, he hides his long, slender head between my legs, the rest of his body sticking out comically. In the winter, I buckle him into a long coat with a snood, two straps crisscrossing under the belly, two at the neck. He always stands patiently as I do it. The nursing home offers both short-term and hospice care it can be difficult to tell who is in for what. Our favorite patient, Vince, uses two crutches. He's usually standing on them in the hallway when we visit, quote, trying to stay up and active. Technically, I've inherited Vince from the previous volunteer assigned to Phil. When the staff see Phil and I, they gesture down the hall to Vince and say, oh, your friend is here. Sometimes I wonder who's who. Phil, my old buddy, Vince always says, and shifts his weight on the crutches so he can stroke the top of his head. They're quite the pair, Phil and Vince, Vince and Phil, standing long-legged in the hallway together. Did you know Phil used to be called Road Gator, I offer one day? Vince gets a kick out of that. It was a bad fall, I learn, those darn stairs. Vince loves to talk about his apartment and his life in North End, how excited he is to get back to it. That sounds nice, I say. 
Yes, he says, it's too stuffy here. I'll be out soon. One week, he's gone. Phil and I make our rounds and hover in the empty hallway. Many weeks later, I find myself at Cafe Vittoria, sitting by the big patio windows that spill open onto the street. It's a balmy summer day, the sky pale blue, north end bustling with a steady stream of people past my table. And then I see him. I must be making a face, because when he sees me, he stops in the street. How funny it is that joy can be so easily communicated. Of course, really, it all boils down to this. Phil, I mouth, gesturing effusively at myself. In my head, the words tumble past each other to get out. How are you doing? I'm so glad you made it back. Can you believe we ran into each other? What are the chances? Yes, he nods and smiles. Phil. Uh, thank you so much, Melanie. Beautiful reading. Our next uh, piece is an honorable mention, Grief Sandwich by Daria Hershkovich. Daria is a fourth year medical student at UMass Chan, whose writing uh, was also an award winner last year. Uh, she re uh, received her BS in biology at UMass Amherst and will be staying at UMass for internal residency, internal medicine residency in July. She's from Framingham and is proud to be a UMass lifer. Uh, Daria enjoys caring for complex liver patients. She believes they offer important lessons in how to provide com uh, comprehensive and compassionate patient care while, while navigating challenging patient relationships, debilitating conditions, and grief. Thank you very much. Uh, my piece is titled Grief Sandwich. In 2019, Ella Yellick O'Connor, also known as her stage name Lord, wrote an email to her fans that included a poem she had recently wrote. I eat a grief sandwich. I wear a grief coat. I see a grief film. She added in the email, if you know how it feels to lose someone close, I'm sure that makes sense to you. Everything about you becomes a grief thing. As a shiny, freshly 21-year-old Lord fan who was aglow with her first acceptance to medical school, I was taken aback by the desolation of my favorite pop star. The phrase, I wear a grief coat, ricocheted around my brain for the next few weeks. It was the saddest thing I had ever heard. I had never experienced that kind of grief she was describing. I did not know it to exist. It seemed debilitating, all-consuming. Looking toward the next chapter of my life, knowing that this emotion existed somewhere yonder, I was scared. In September of 2023, I enrolled in a transplant infectious disease rotation. The first patient we rounded together on was John, a 32-year-old male with acute alcohol-associated hepatitis. He needed a new liver, but had an infection that made transplant impossible. Despite never being diagnosed with any liver disease prior to Labor Day weekend, John was now dying. Between the entourage of the white coats of the transplant rounding team, there was only one person I focused in on, his wife. Looking at her, the only thing that came to my mind were Ella's words from 2019. I wear a grief coat. She was holding her husband's hand, a tight web of jaundiced fingers and faded tans as she held her head down. She was dressed in all black with a black hat over her face. She was crumpled inwards, met face to face with the inevitable truth that her husband was going to pass away soon. I bit my tongue until there was blood to keep from crying. After morning rounds, I approached my attending. Surely there's something else we can try so he could be transplanted, I asked. She looked at me sadly and shook her head no. John was dead by lunch. I went to the cafeteria and ate a grief sandwich. The rest of the month went similarly, meeting patients, them being too infectious to be transplanted and watching them die. The ICU felt like one long grief film and I was not allowed to look away. I mourned all the time with patients, their families and alone. I had never been around so much loss. It surrounded me like a shadow. I longed for the version of my world I had before September 
before grief seeped through the walls of my hospital and made me helpless and small. On the last day of the block, it was sunny when I left the hospital. I took a deep breath and not knowing what else to do, I just walked home. A few months later, I was traveling with my mom and sisters when I found out my grandfather had died. He was 94 years old and had lived a beautiful life doting on his daughters and grandchildren. I loved him very much. I felt hollow. For the first time, I personally understood what Ella had meant. I sat beside my fiance at dinner eating a grief sandwich. I wore a grief coat to school and I was the grief film. It was oppressive and it was all consuming. In the Jewish faith, after a mourner buries their loved one, they sit in their home for a full week. After a week, the mourner takes a walk around the block outside. The walk is difficult, but it symbolizes the transition from the overwhelming grief of their home to an attempt at resuming daily life. The walk after my grandfather passed felt like a marathon to me. In 2020, a year after Lord sent her grieving email, she released an album called Solar Power. The album was an intimate depiction of her life after loss, about her learning to appreciate the sun on her skin after grief. I didn't resonate with the album at all when it was released those years ago, but now, four years later, it's become my most listened to record. Grief isn't going anywhere. It's inextricably linked to medicine, a part of mine and my patients' lives. Sometimes you eat a grief sandwich. Other times, you put the grief coat on and allow yourself to feel its weight before walking along, taking the time to feel the power of sun on your face. Mario, thank you so much for that very, very powerful piece. And what an ending. Well thank done, you. well done. Our next uh, presentation is going to be from previous award winner, uh, Peyton Morris Walton. Uh, she's, she has a video. And uh, since uh, she won the award in 2020 for her prose piece, uh, Little Brown Bird, Peyton went on to create a collection of written reflections on her fourth year capstone project, encompassing memorable patient experiences and how they intersected uh, with reflections on her own memorable life experiences. Uh, her professional career is a little bit complicated, but uh, follows a path. She uh, matched into dermatology in the spring of 2021 uh, at Einstein, uh, Montefiore Einstein in the Bronx and spent her intern year 2021 to 2022 in medicine uh, at Cambridge Health Alliance. She got married in the fall of 2021. And in 2022, she moved to New York City to work in the Bronx for three years uh, at the Montefiore Jacoby Hospital System that, uh, that she works in. Actually, she also, Cambridge and Montefiore are both safety net hospitals that primarily uh, take care of the underinsured or uninsured. Uh, she's not sure, she says, what her future holds after June 2025, TBD. Uh, so we have uh, Peyton by video, and I'm eager to hear her reflections. a dermatology resident at Montefiore Medical Center. I'm a PGY3, so um, that's crazy. I guess it means that I graduated three years ago and I was uh, the Berlin Prize winner in 2020, so for the 2019-2020 academic year, um, which I guess was, it was technically kind of my third year of school. I took a research year, so it was during that between my third and fourth year. Um, I am in dermatology and I did my intern year in Boston, which is my home city at Cambridge Health Alliance, which is a local community hospital. So we see a lot of the same patients as we do um, at UMass. And I have some remarks here. I've just kind of jotted them down. Um, I was hoping to make it in person, but uh, the clinic schedule of resident is sort of ever changing. So I thought I would record a video just to be safe rather than sorry. Um, so I think, you know, it was, one of the things I think about when I think about the Berlin Prize was that for people who are medical students, you know, you're kind of trained to want to get good grades and get good feedback. And 
So it was very encouraging in my sort of writing journey to receive, um, you know, objective feedback that um, other people liked your writing, that people are sort of agreeing with um, the things that you're seeing and thinking. And so I, I, I just liked the opportunity to have people read and essentially comment on my work. Um, and I thought that that was very special. And I think that also whenever there's one of those theories in clinical trials that people behave differently when they're observed. And for me, it's sort of this self thing that whenever I'm writing a lot and like jotting down kind of as I have interactions, I find myself more present and also remembering interactions. And I think that it allows me to take a step back when I'm having um, a hard day or when I'm seeing things that are objectively very sad or difficult because I, I sort of think about it as, oh, I'm going to write about this later, or this is something that is meaningful. And um, I noticed that the more that I write, the more that I see things that I want to write about. Um, I am still writing. I have lately been doing um, some more short form poetry writing, which was not uh, my go-to back in the day. My um, prize-winning piece was an essay, and that was mostly what I had done was like personal essays and kind of short form narrative about patient interactions. And now I find that I also have, you know, in between things or little kind of ideas. And so I've been experimenting a little bit with poetry. One um, thing that kind of stands out to me is that during intern year, I really hated and found it so stressful whenever you had to go back to the family or call the family again of a patient and tell them either, you know, the plan had changed or the patient's going downhill or somebody is not available or something, you know, we don't have this medication or insurance doesn't cover X, Y, Z. And, um, and I felt like I had I was kind of carrying around all these regrets and so um, wrote a short form poem about sort of the meaning of regret during intern year and regret meaning to kind of call a patient's family and say, I'm sorry, the plan has changed. And, um, you know, overall, I just I'm really so grateful for the chance to uh, speak virtually today and um, for the chance to have participated in the Berlin Award and submit essays and, and sort of think uh, about patient interactions from this writing lens. And I would just encourage other people to continue to write as well. Uh, I think that my favorite thing about writing is that it continues to connect me to people and um, friends and, and new friends um, have mentioned like they Googled me and they read my essay and then we, we talk about the themes. It mentions the loss of someone close to me and it's been a way for people to learn that about me, you know, something that I wouldn't usually volunteer and kind of deepened a lot of those relationships. People on my interview trail um, saw it and mentioned it and a few people actually read it um, at other schools and I was really touched by that and obviously kind of really valued those interviews and end up ranking them very highly. <laughs> Um, and so I think that it just that's always been my favorite part about writing is that it both brings you into the moment and then it, it brings that moment to other people and builds uh, personal relationships with them in addition to the personal relationship that it was built with the subject. So um, thank you so much and uh, can't wait to watch this back if I'm not here. Hopefully I can log on late and um, best of luck to all the writers and doctors out there. Bye. Okay. Uh, what, a, what a great uh, summary of uh, what writing is all about in medicine land. I was really impressed, uh, Peyton, um, by your sense that the more you are involved in, in medical life, the more you have to write about. And I think it, it really is a, a kind of infinitely deep well. William Carlos Williams, our iconic doctor poet, uh, said uh, at a certain point in his career that medicine and poetry to him amounted to, uh, he said, the same thing. So I think that's a, a, a great guidepost. And I'm so glad that other people are reading your work. Uh, I just want everybody to know that all of the uh, award-winning pieces from the last 20 years are on my website. 
Uh, it's richardmberlin.com. You can just Google me. Uh, but there's a section of my website devoted to the Berlin Award. Uh, Peyton's uh, winning piece, Little Brown Bird, is on there. Uh, Noah's work is on there. And uh, it's a good resource if you want to see what uh, some of your medical school colleagues uh, wrote about a year ago or 20 years ago. So our third place winner this year uh, was Abigail DeNyck for uh, her piece, Hospital Food. Abigail uh, is originally from Spokane, Washington. She attended Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas, and in college, uh, minored in creative writing and wrote for the marketing department, chronicling life on campus. She loves storytelling, which drew her in part to medicine. And she's grateful for the opportunities she's had as a first year medical student to continue refining her practice through interacting with patients and with reflection. Uh, so we're looking forward to hearing from you, Abigail, for your piece, Hospital Food. I think that's my mom logging on, so. Hi, mom. <laughs> Okay, this is hospital food. I'm convinced that the Popeyes on the Johns Hopkins campus is the most maliciously placed restaurant in the world. Amidst the buildings connected by glass tunnels stands the sadistic fast food joint, reminding people undergoing pancreas resections they cannot eat fried chicken, even though that's the thing they want most in the world. Looking at it from my window every day was a unique form of torture. The, nur the nurse who was there when I transferred out of the ICU said I was lucky. I got a corner room, a great luxury, allowing me to see both the south and west faces of the restaurant, including the drive through window. By the time I started to feel taunted by Popeyes, I had been NPO for six days. Throughout the night, I would wake up to take my pills and turn my head left, away from the poles supporting snaking wires and bags of fluid. I would look at the intersection below and the sign kitty corner to my room. My mouth would fill with saliva. My dreams buzzed neon orange. That light never went off. My pancreas had been cut in half. The half with the tumor had been excised and butterflied filleted like a juicy chicken breast. The doctor showed me a picture of the dripping slab of meat on the operating table. Months before, I had an ovarian cyst burst and I went to the hospital concerned about the pain deep in my abdomen. The tumor was an incidental finding forced reluctantly into my consciousness. He was outside the ER waiting for me, eating McDonald's nuggets on the sidewalk at 4 a.m. He looked amused by our surroundings, his brow furrowed like it did that night we met at a bar last fall. I held my belongings in a hospital bag and stood in the spring DC air, numbed by the morphine. He took me home and tucked me in. Tomorrow we would face the reality of a dark enhancing mass on a CT scan, but not yet. I did the MRI with contrast, the lab work, and the fine needle biopsy. I kept my head down. My primary doctor called and asked if I was alone. I said yes, but tell me anyway. I looked up to find he was there. I'm still not sure how he knew. I looked at that intersection as he sat braiding my hair. Doctors and nurses rushed below on the street in bright scrubs with hard-earned badges. The braid would fall out immediately when he would get up for his next spiel. He kept trying, but each day it came out worse than the last. I didn't mind. I thought about whether he would get a sandwich or pizza for lunch today. The last few days he had eaten Subway. I thought about how hungry I was. I was hungry to understand how this happened. I wanted to know how I would get to be on the other side of the bed in a white coat when this had destroyed all my plans to do so. I wanted to understand why I suddenly missed my mom's cooking, even though I'd lived 2,000 miles away from her for years. I wanted to know if I was a disturbed person to feel excited waking up in a hospital room, a room I had longed to be in, even if this was not the way I imagined getting there. I wanted to know if I was being silly and unrealistic thinking about the future. Mainly, I wondered why he was still there, braiding my hair, when I got a cancer diagnosis six months after we met. Yet his presence made it seem so simple. If you are hungry, eat. If you are tired, rest. If you are afraid, dream. 
When he pulled around the car on my discharge day, my mom wheeled me out into the Baltimore sun and helped me in the passenger seat. We piled in. He drove us down the coast with his hands steady at 10 and two. My mom whispered in my ear to never look back. I tugged at his sleeve, reminding him to pull over for fried chicken. Thank you, Abigail, for the courage and grace to read that at the at the reading ceremony. Hope you continue to do well. Our second place award winner is To Be a Body by Sarah Lee. Uh, Sarah is a third year MD PhD student who's studying how to use digital tools to better understand suicide and mental illness. She's written poetry since high school and is inspired by unfinished sentences and words that go nowhere. Her poem, To Be a Body, is a reflection of what it means to be foreign in a body, in a society, and in a nation. Sarah weaves together the anxieties of the COVID-19 pandemic, the violence of anti-Asian anti racism, and the devastating impact of illness. To be a body, tumor, T-U-M-O-R, tumor. Definition, someone once told me on the street that my people were like a tumor in this country. Cancerous, malignant, ugly, worst of all, infiltrating. Tumor, T-U-M-O-R, tumor. Definition, what good is a tumor in the body when it exists to be removed? on paclitaxel, carboplatin, zap it with radiation like the first time they used the atomic bomb. You gotta kill them before they kill you. Tumor, T-U-M-O-R, tumor. Let me use it in a sentence. My mother takes an ice cream spoon and scoops out her uterus. She pulls in the delicate fronds of the fallopian tubes and carefully peels back her cervix. On her womb, a vertical line, crossing with the faded scar of a C-section, like an exorcism. She tells me, be careful these days. Don't stand too close to the subway tracks. This body is out to get you. Cancer, C-A-N-C-E-R, cancer. Someone tells me the China virus is spreading. Do I need to spell it out for you? He grabs my shoulder and rips my mask off my face to tell me that at least in America, we have freedom here. As if my mother doesn't watch the news, eyes blinking at the sound of gunshots in an Atlanta spa. As if she doesn't hurry into her car to avoid the unmasked man staring at her in the parking lot. As if she too doesn't shrink from the night, but also the day, but also the sunlight, her papered skin, unable to withstand UV rays anymore. Do I need to spell it out for you? This body never wanted you from the very beginning. I tell them I know how to spell. Cancer, C-A-N-C-E-R. Synonym. There's familiar slippage of time as I watch my mother's small head sink into two pillows. She tells me vocabulary doesn't sit well on her tongue these days, our lives, dictated by distance as she calls a sister she hasn't seen in 10 years, a daughter she hasn't seen in one. I trace the crevices growing between her veins and press her hand close to my ear to make sure she's still breathing. You pray at the altar of Pfizer. You ask for forgiveness from the God of Doxel. You phone the oracle of doctor to ask how long she has left. You watch your mother wither away at the hands of a body that never tried to save her anyway. Um, thank you so much. Great reading uh, of a poem that uh, was wonderful on paper and even better to hear it in your voice. So thank you. Our uh, next speaker is 
Noah Rosenberg, who is a, the Triple Crown winner of the award in the past. Uh, Noah uh, is a board certified family physician who provides acute hospital level care in the home. And Noah and I have a, a discussion about what he's doing in Texas with that program. And it's really amazing to think about uh, bringing the hospital level care to everyone's home. Just spectacular idea. Uh, he joined Dispatch Health in October 21, and he's the advanced, advanced care medical director uh, for the state of Texas. And then he was promoted to the regional medical director covering half of the United States. Uh, he graduated from uh, UMass Chan Medical School with Alpha Omega Alpha Honors, completed his family medicine residency, serving as chief resident in his final year. And if that wasn't enough, when he was all done with that, he obtained his MBA from Harvard Business School while practicing as an academic hospitalist. Uh, in addition to his professional work, he's volunteered at Christ's Family uh, Clinic, a charity clinic for uninsured adults in Dallas. And he resides in Dallas with his wife, a pediatrician and fellow UMass residency graduate, and their two daughters. So Noah, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Dr. Rowan, so much for the invitation to be here tonight. And thank you for everything you've done in establishing this award. Thank you also, Dr. Hatem and everyone else who has supported this award through the years. I was asked to speak on the impact that the Berlin Award writing and the humanities have had on me as a person and as my, on my career as a physician. And three things in particular came to mind. The first one is the importance of stories and being a really excellent clinician. The second as a signal for institutions and organizations that I wanted to be part of and devote the work of my life to. And then the last as a way to uh, pursue balance in my life, a uh, task that seems uh, never ending. In terms of uh, the importance of stories and being an excellent clinician, um, I realized uh, in the process of writing that our medical educations and residency are very, in many ways very stacked toward uh, the attainment of knowledge and the facts about physiology and anatomy as they really should be to make one a good doctor. And in the, in the course, I think toward especially the end of residency and my career now as an attending physician, I've realized in many ways that those things, at least from a patient's perspective, are really table stakes. You know, not many people go to their family or friends and say, oh, my doctor treats me with the most best evidence-based medicine there is. They talk about how their doctor relates to them, how their doctor makes them feel. Um, so as an example of that, in my patients and the care model that I practice under, I've started asking them what they're most excited about getting out of the hospital, getting back to their home uh, to, to do, um, and have had and have heard uh, just very touching answers that ran the gamut from uh, a man whose wife was dying at home and on hospice. So he wanted to get back there out of the hospital himself to be able to spend the last few days that she had left with her. Um, to just recently, I had a patient tell me uh, how much he liked fixing up classic cars. Uh, and then he had a classic car in his garage that he was working on. Um, and I was able to talk with him about how I used to help my stepfather uh, fix up cars when I was a boy. And uh, we got to really bond over that. And then in terms of the next one as a signal for institutions and organizations that I wanted to be part of, um, I think uh, in many ways, it was a privilege to uh, stumble upon medical education at the University, University of Massachusetts Chan Medical School. Um, and I think it, I, while I was in the midst of it, I didn't know in some ways what a privilege it was, because it's not every institution that has something like the Berlin Award, um, has a course of study in the sustainability uh, uh, elements of medicine, um, has a humanities lab, uh, which I just heard about. Uh, this evening. 
Um, and um, I think for me, because there, there really are so many things that we can devote the work of our lives to, uh, the, the work of medicine, um, finding ways to determine what institutions and groups we want to uh, invest our time and efforts uh, into, that's a, a great signal for me, how much uh, the, the humanities are valued there and how much there's real tangible support in the work of the humanities. And then finally, as a way to pursue balance in my life, uh, which I sometimes feel like I have more or less of, depending uh, on the day, even the hour sometimes. Um, it's uh, writing for me has been a great way to uh, try to maintain balance in life because it can kind of take me out of the day-to-day -day, uh, work, um, the, uh, the hustle and bustle of having kids um, and uh, allow me to just take some time for myself uh, and for reflection in particular, um, and I'm a big believer that uh, the creative writing process and the value uh, in that um, is part and parcel of now the, the research uh, that's showing the, the personal benefits, for instance, of things like gratitude journals and reflection. Um, uh, and I've certainly felt that. Um, and uh, has in some in many ways also been a signal for me about when things are may not be uh, in balance as much as I'd like them to be. Um, I'm still uh, writing, uh, particularly poetry, um, because it, it feels like what I have time uh, to now. Um, but I'm uh, working on uh, two epic poems, and uh, my wife has a third one on the way. Uh, so even if I don't have as much time for writing as I once did. Um, the uh, uh, things like the Berlin Award, uh, the humanities and writing in my life is a thread that's carried through. Um, and as much or as little time as I have for it now, I know it will always be there and uh, always be a very important part of my journey. Thank you. Um, Noah, thank you so much for that. Uh, it's, it's rewarding to hear about the rewards for you. So thank you. And uh, good luck with numero tres. Amazing. So uh, we have um, two poets to finish the evening. Uh, the first is uh, Alex Hamill, a first year medical student at UMass Chan. Uh, Alex went to UMass Amherst for his undergraduate studies, where he played baseball, graduated with a degree in biochemistry. And his creative writing is influenced by many of the pioneers of American literature who lived in his hometown of Concord, Massachusetts. In his free time, he enjoys sports and outdoor activities, and he works as a student leader in both the Sidekicks program and the learning communities at UMass Chan. And I think we have uh, Alex on video, video recording. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex. Uh, I'm a first year medical student. Um, thank you for the honorable mention. Um, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there to present, but thank you again for this opportunity um, to share my work. Um, this is a poem called Shadow, um, just inspired by my experience so far as a medical student. Um, and I hope that it um, resonates a little bit. Shadow. I am a shadow, not the absence of light, but a gentle reminder that you were once me and I will be you. I find the corner, yet remain in the way, and I smile and nod until my cheeks are sore. I am a shadow, not the absence of light, but a step or two behind and a question or four. I wait and I listen for lapses and juxtapositions and I take wrong turns when dropping off labs. I am a shadow, not the absence of light, but a gentle reminder of the light that exists behind everyone. I yearn for the day when I'm two steps ahead and I have a shadow to follow along. Thank you. Great. And our first place winner, Elizabeth Irvin, 
uh, Two True Stories poem. Uh, Liz is a third year medical student at UMass Chan on the population-based urban and rural community health track. She studied uh, women's gender and sexuality at Barnard College in New York. And she reports that in medicine, a discipline that often encourages its practitioners to deny their own vulnerability, poetry has become her vital countercurrent, a practice of remaining sensitive to the pain and joy of healing. I have to say, reading the 53 submissions this year, uh, as you've heard so far this evening, there are just so much good work. And when I was uh, reading in blinded fashion, uh, Liz's poem, I thought, this is a poem by someone who has some real experience as a poet. There's There was a lot of craft and power in her language and her choice of words. And I was really pleased when uh, we lifted the blinders and I learned uh, that her essays have appeared in Hectoan International, Neologism Poetry Journal, Burning Wood Literary Journal, and Thimble Literary Magazine. So good for her. Uh, our first place winner, Liz Irvin, looking forward to hearing you read Two True Stories. Hi, thank you so much everyone for coming out. I think uh, writing is such a solitary activity so much of the time. So any opportunity to come and see other faces and build community around it is really special. Um, I'm gonna set the stage a little bit. So I'm gonna tell a little bit about my background just before I get into the poem. Um, so I grew up in here in Massachusetts, but we would spend every single summer break, winter break, school vacation at my grandparents' farm in Western New York, the most magical place you could imagine. Um, I'm the seventh generation that's actually worked on my grandparents' farm, and my grandfather would be the fifth generation that's owned and operated the land. Um, I actually went there a month before medical school, and I sat down with my grandpa, and I told him, Grandpa, I got into medical school. I'm going to be a doctor. And his response was, don't worry. It's not too late. You can still drop out, and you can come work for me. So while I was visiting him, um, I guess, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you uh, look at it, um, I was bystander to a really terrifying incident that happened on the land. Um, a kid was riding a motorbike, turned a corner and um, flew off the bike. Uh, I say fortunately because I worked as an EMT in college and it was one of those moments where you are so, so grateful that you can do even one thing to help. Um, but in the aftermath of the incident, um, I started to see it through my grandfather's eyes and uh, my grandfather growing up in this world where danger and the threat of traumatic injury kind of lurked around every corner um, in the sort of farm world, um, I sort of saw it differently. Um, and it had me kind of questioning the the legacy of both resilience and, and certainly trauma that um, I've inherited. So this is called Two True Stories. Subtle bend on the rural collector. Black walnut tree grown thick and varicose. On this landing place between the pine scarp and the lake's ledge, dust hung in plumes. I crossed the living room to the barn sparrows nesting. Graham walked out for the mail. Jewel arched the hose at her begonia beds. My grandfather scouted the fields for sowing season. And the golden rod rooted down in the hollows of the cattle plod groove. Dirt bike banked right roared and slammed against the ditch rim. We left the red flag cocked. The hose flooded the driveway. We forgot everything but the mud plug and the tailpipe, the half moon grimace of the boy that no one knew. Everything happened so slow and so fast, my grandfather said later. One minute we were all there together. We waited a lifetime for an ambulance on these back roads. And the next, I boarded the volunteer rig in bloody pajamas, my hand still on the bag valve, jewel close behind. My grandfather hastened to pick up the bits of broken helmet in the grass. And then he set them back down. My grandfather, as a child, watched the neighbor's boy run pale-faced from the mill, cradling his crushed rose petal hand.
Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming to this year's award event. Spectacular readings, wonderful to hear from our previous winners. And I hope that uh, the award stimulates you to have started your submissions for next year. So see you, see you in uh, 2025. Thank you everyone.